So, uh, we're starting chapter 10 right now, Introduction to Routing and Routing Protocols. Um, this is extremely important, especially if you want to go beyond the CCNA. Um, you're going to have a test solely on this for the CCMP, and then the, the CCIE, you're being tested strictly on, you know, routing and switching. Um, so, let's begin. Um, so, first let's start talking about the default gateway. Um, the default gateway determines the standard location that data should be directed from the layer 3 perspective. Um, thinking about the default gateway on a PC first rather than a router, on a standard Windows PC entering the IP config command on a terminal window will provide you with the gateway. So you guys have you know, had to do that numerous times, I'm sure, with techs out in the field. Do an IP config, see what IPs you're getting, see what gateway you're getting, can you ping your gateway? That verifies if you get a good uh, you know, layer 3 connection at least to the device you're directly connected to. Um, can be fur further diagnosed using the ping uh, commands as well as the ARP-A, ARP-A and ARP-D commands uh, on a Windows PC. On a router, the default gateway is defined by the default route, which is a static route uh, listed below. Uh, IP route, the first set of zeros is the uh, IP address, second set of zeros is the subnet mask. So that's basically saying all IPs and then going to a you know another IP address listed here, which would be the the next hop. So yeah, it doesn't have to be an IP though, right? What's up? Uh, it, no, you're right. On a on a Cisco router, you can set it to like say you're going to have a interface. Yeah, especially like if you're going to have a dynamic IP, setting your IP route to you know that interface um, is, is going to direct it there. Um, so that's that's the default route, um, and then of course routes use the more specific options first so if you have traffic that needs to go a very specific direction not to your your default gateway if you've got a more specific route here it's going to take precedence over the, the gateway this is going to be the the gateway of last resort uh, routing sources routing sources are what provides the router with routing information um, routing sources include connected interfaces which would be directly connected devices routes remain in the routing table as long as the interface is active and has a valid IP uh, static routes which uh, routes remain in the routing table as long as the static configuration remains and the next hop is valid so uh, it being valid meaning the next uh, the interface of that next hop is still up and then uh, routing protocols which is what we're going to get into in the next uh, two or three chapters uh, routes remain in the routing table as long as the next hop is valid and do not stop hearing the networks being advertised from the neighbor router. Okay, so talking about, uh, you know, you can learn you can learn these routes from all these different sources. Um, so administrative distance determines which route is preferred if you are receiving multiple sources for the same route, for the exact same route. And so, you know, anything that's directly connected to you Obviously, you're going to prefer that is the, uh, you know, even over a static route, if you can see that something is directly connected to you in layer 2 and layer 3, it's got a default distance of zero. <coughs> a static route, because um, you're, you're assigning a static route basically to um, have very tight control of where the routing goes. It's got a default distance of one. And then you can see for the various, um, the various routing protocols, there's others besides this, but the ones that they have listed have... Uh, distances corresponding to that so um, you know lower values are, are better obviously so you know uh, if you're learning something via RIP version 1 and v or version 2 uh, or v via e uh, OSPF it's always going to prefer the OSPF route over the, the RIP routes um, and then static routes which we already kind of touched on when we talked about the default gateway at least at least in a router um, uh, without the configuration of a static route or the use of dynamic routing protocols, devices will only know the routes to directly connected devices. So in this little diagram down here, um, you've got two routers, each with uh, two networks. So from router A, he's going to know directly you know, about all these LAN devices that are directly connected to him on this 172.16 uh, network. And he'll also know about router B over here on this uh, the 192.168.1.10 because he's directly connected to it. But he's not going to know about these devices over here uh, on the other side of router B because he's not directly connected to him. So if you were to go into router A and set a, a static route, um, you know, of 172.IP route 172.17.0.0, uh, 
and subnet mask pointing to 192.168.1.10 over here router B then it's going to have the the information it needs to to get that far in the network and get to these devices that are not directly connected and it can't see immediately and same thing on router B it, you know it can see these two sets of devices because uh, it's directly connected but these land side computers on router A it cannot see because it's not directly connected so setting up a static route of 172.16.0 at a zero you know, with a subnet uh, pointing to 192.168.1.9 is going to get to the right place because it's going to send the traffic to router A where the static route is uh, set up and on a router A it's directly connected so it's going to know to get to, to those computers. So, um, Static routes are generally preferred over dynamic routing protocols when one of these situations come up. You're working with a very simple or stub network um, so you know you just just like that we were looking at at that example with the router A and router B very very simple network um, there's not really a reason to set up a dynamic routing protocol because the, the number of routes you're going to have is going to be very limited uh, another reason you might want to set up static routes is if you just want complete control over routing like for whatever reason you don't want to leave it up to um, a dynamic routing protocol you want to have complete granularity of, um, of controlling routes that's another reason you might want to institute entirely the static routes and then uh, occasionally like if you need to conserve bandwidth on links now that one's a little bit less uh, less necessary anymore because what it's saying to conserve bandwidth they're, what they're referring to is whenever you have a dynamic routing protocol it's going to send route updates across the various links to the other adjacent routers that's going to take up a small amount of bandwidth to send those links so in certain situations where you have very very limited uh, bandwidth on certain links uh, you may want to have static routes rather than worry about the um, the bandwidth co being conserved from the route updates of a dynamic routing protocol in, in networks today this uh, third option is really not something you need to worry about for the most part so uh, one and two though you do a little bit um, static routes take the form of and this is exactly the same as we set up the static route for the IP uh, default gateway IP space route space the the network address of the uh, the block the subnet mask of that block and then the single IP of the next hop address so you know just like we were talking about um, a minute ago 172 .0 .0, 255.255.0.0 and then to this address of 192.168.5.55 okay and then additionally you also have floating static routes um, a floating static route is specified by adding a different value for the administrative distance at the end of the route. So uh, I don't know if you guys can read it, it's kind of small up there on your screen, but uh, the second line on router B has a, a, a static route, you know, it's the exact same format as before, IP space route space 172.17.0.0, 255.55.0.0 uh, to an address of 192.168.1.6, and then it has a space in the number 2. So what that's doing is um, a standard static route has an administrative distance of 1, as we talked about before. Connected devices are 0, static routes are 1, and then the various routing protocols have different administrative distances, depending on what they are. By, by making a space and then putting that 2 and setting the administrative distance higher than 1, um, it's only going to prefer that if there's not a static route pointing it elsewhere. So directly above this line, and I, again, I, it's, it's pretty small and pretty bad on that screen up there that you guys are looking at. Um, they have a static route that points the exact same network address, uh, network and subnet um, listed here to a different address, 192.168.1.10. So in the event that that link goes down for some reason, that 192.168.1.10 is no longer accessible, um, it's still got a backup of, um, of this that will only apply whenever that static route the first static route with an administrative, a natural administrative distance of one goes down and it no longer has that in the routing table. Only at that point would it prefer, it's, it's going to have both of these routes in the routing table anyway, um, but it's only going to use the one with the lowest administrative distance. So it's at that point it would prefer, prefer that one. Okay, so it's like a second gateway basically? Yeah, it's like a secondary, um, like if you're setting a static route to um, somewhere and you've got a redundant link for it to get there elsewhere, but you want it to prefer one over the other, it's it's a way of basically having a backup route in case that first uh, that first link goes down for some reason, like DB. <laughs> yeah.